writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business, coming to you from Kobo's headquarters in Toronto. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and in today's episode, we have Renee sitting down with a man of many talents, Eli Roth, who's an actor, producer, what else is he? Um, I think he does a bit of everything. And we also spoke to Owen Vaccaro, who is a 12-year-old, I believe he's 12, actor uh, in the movie. He's the main uh, actor, as well as the music composer, Nathan Barr. And what are you chatting to them about today? Well, it's interesting because the movie is based on a 1973 book by John Belairs of the same name. Um, you know, all this whimsical sort of storytelling happened uh, long before Harry Potter, about 25 years before. The original magical story. That is true. And the movie just came out this year. So uh, it is quite interesting. We talked about the making of the movie. We also spoke to the three interviewees about um, their favorite books and why people should read them. All right. Jam-packed interview. Yes. So without further ado, here is the interview. First off, thanks very much for taking the time. Uh, I watched the movie a couple of nights ago. Um, to me, Kate Blanchett can do no wrong. So obviously, I love the humor that's in there for adults. Um, and you've done lots of horror, which is geared towards adults. So um, just tell me a little bit about uh, your experience of directing a movie that was fantasy horror based for uh, a family audience. Well, I love movies that the whole family can go see. And it feels like they don't make them anymore. You know, it feels like you're in kind of a PG-13 superhero universe or a G-rated animated. And when I was a kid, the movies that were the most fun to go see were those Amblin films. It was Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. and Gremlins and Goonies and uh, Back to the Future. And then there were these really cool, weird PG movies like Dark Crystal and Dragon Slayer and Time Bandits. And, and they had stuff it, that adults could really get into as well. And Labyrinth was another one. And over the years, I found my friends with kids, uh, my brothers, everyone. They say those are the movies that they still show to their kids. They're, they're, that sort of film today doesn't really exist. So I wanted to make a movie that was a modern day Amblin film. Ironically, it's you know set in, in the 1950s, but something that would be like that Gremlins for the next generation. And that I feel like now there's movies for parents or children or for children, but not for both. So yeah. the goal was to create something that had fantasy magic, fun, humor, a little bit of scares, a little bit of drama. I mean, we keep switching the record. You know, it's like you're listening to an album and there's five or six different songs. It's like, whoa, but they somehow all go together as a cohesive piece. So that was the fun was doing that. Yeah, for sure. And I, th I think it's great. And I'm going to be chatting with Nathan later. And you mentioned um, those sort of old school sort of like horror slash fantasy films. And, uh, you know, I think it comes through in the music as well, sort of like yeah. those, there's certain sounds that are a very old school horror flick, which I loved. So. Well, this is about as old school as you can get. I mean, what Nathan did was he restored this Wurlitzer one of a kind organ. I mean, to even call it an organ doesn't quite do it justice because there's about 30 instruments within it that it controls. It's like you that for the silent films, you would live score and foley the movie. So the instruments would function as the foley. So. You know, wind chimes. I mean, there's all sorts of things. In this, and he spent five years restoring it. I mean, this one of a kind yeah. thing that scored so many classic films. And the first time I played, he played it for me. I mean, it was literally on the floor of a studio, totally blown away. It, it it just transports you back to another era. And the movie was, you know, we have a film where there's like a talking organ. I mean, what are the chances that he spends five years building the studio at the time when I get to make an Amblin movie with a talking organ? And I really think that. That's what connects, that's what gives the film its cohesion is the music. And that's really yeah. Nathan's incredible, phenomenal score. For sure. And I think I, I read that that organ was at uh, Fox Studios Fox. since the 1920s or something. Yeah. Yeah, since the 20s. That's why it lasted. I mean, there's, it's, yeah. the only, it's the only one that's in that condition. And yeah. even then, it had been boxed up for 25 years. But it did yeah. score the Sound of Music and Patton and Star Trek and John Williams and Spielberg used it in Empire of the Sun. I mean, it's just this incredible. One of my favorite scenes in the movie was definitely the uh, pumpkins attack. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Yeah. It was a mess was that, to shoot. Was that fun uh, directing that? Oh, it's that. disgusting. I mean, it's hard because we had the actors locked into what we called Goo Mountain when yeah, the goo yeah. hardens and then they start coming. And um, 
it was a mess. I mean, getting the pumpkin vomit, we used first we used slime from the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards from that that company yeah. that makes it, but <laughs> that didn't really look like vomit. It was too slimy. Right. So then we yeah. thickened it up with blue, but then we tested it on poor Jimmy. It's on the it's on the DVD and Blu-ray and the behind the scenes. I'll have we yeah. puked in Jimmy's face several times. And then the glue was too strong and it got stuck in his beard and we didn't want it to be toxic. It was it was a whole ordeal to get the right consistency, the right projectile. I'm very particular about my pumpkin vomit. Yeah. <laughs> well, it definitely worked. So congrats. Thank you. Um, did you uh, read the house with a clock in its walls um, as a kid? I did not. But I read a lot of Raul Dahl. Um, yeah. My favorite author is probably Judy Bloom okay. and E.B. White. I love those books growing up at Raul Dahl for that dark young fantasy. Um, but I, I was not familiar with Bel Airs. However, I love Edward Gorey and I collect his artwork awesome. and I have the cover for a Bel Airs book, Johnny Dixon and the Hand of the Necromancer. And so as soon as I got the script, I thought, oh my God, there's another Gorey Bel Airs. I knew exactly what the mood was and the, the Gorey illustrations I just loved. It's really, uh, that's why I did this Edward Gorey homage yeah. credits at the end of the movie. Um, it was, I just read it, I read the script and then read the book right away. It's one of those things, it's very rare to get a piece of material that falls in your hands and you just read it and see it exactly. Do you have any uh, like must-reads you could tell us? What are a couple or one or, one or two of your favorite books? I mean, I loved Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little. Those are two of my favorites book. I had a pet pig and I okay. owned some of the artwork from Charlotte's Web that I got at auction. Nice. Um, Charlie, and, you know, Charlie and Chocolate Factory, Raul Dahl. Yeah. Yeah, and I love Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, but Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, Animal Farm is one of those books. Yeah, cool. What should people expect, uh, and the outtakes or the the bonus content of the DVD? Like well, obviously we have a very funny cast, and so there's some amazing comedy stuff, um, and gag reels and outtakes. There's also, you know, we we go into how you know whole piece on the world of Oregon and how Nathan Barr restored it and how we use it in the movie and. With John Hutman, our production designer, and how we built the automatons and the visual effects and how we brought the pumpkins yeah. to life. Okay. Um, so with alternate opening and alternate ending that we had, some stuff that we, you know, for various reasons didn't make it into the movie that's fantastic on its own. And then us pranking Jack Black by putting a goat in his trailer and him freaking yeah. out. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, well, thank you very much for your time and congrats on the movie. And I think it will be a hit around the holidays, so. Thank you so much. Hi, Owen, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Well, first off, I just wanted to say you did a great job in the movie. I watched it a couple of nights ago. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, what was a what was it like working with um, with Kate and Jack, and or what was your favorite part of doing this movie? Yeah, it was absolutely they they're fantastic. They're so good at what they do, and they make like acting itself is already so much fun, but they just make it so much better. Um, but I think the best part about working with them was just we would have sporadic dance parties at any given time, any given moment, randomly. Just we'd bust out. We would all like we'd take turns like taking all the camera and like everyone would watch the monitor, and it was pretty great. <laughs> okay, cool. Any particular song you were dancing to? Like, what's your, your favorite tune? Oh, um, immigrant song, Led Zeppelin. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the movie is about, just in a, a quick couple of sentences, and why people need to see it? Yeah, well, it's about um, an unlikely family who gets together and has to uh, overcome a bunch of stuff that they accidentally put together. And you should see the movie, because it's a nice family film. It's a gateway horror film. So if you really want your kids to like horror movies, here's how you like start them off. Um, yeah, that's why you should go see it. It's cool. It's fun movie. Cool. And do you ever, uh, just out of curiosity, do you ever watch horror movies you're not supposed to watch? Horror movies are my favorite. I think, I think my mom knows specifically that I'm okay with a lot of these horror movies, but I think it was my dad because he watched more horror movies, like, when he was a kid than my mom, so he was traumatized by most of them. Like, I really, I want to watch so bad Nightmare on Elm Street, but that was, like, the one horror movie that terrified my dad, so he won't let me watch it, but, like... All my friends are like, oh my gosh, oh, we're going to have such a great time watching Nightmare on Elm Street. And I'm like, oh, cool, yeah, I'll see if I can come. Hey, Dad, can I watch this movie? I'm not I'm not just saying my dad. I'm not going to throw out my, my dad's name. My mom sometimes says I can't watch specific horror movies. But <laughs> it's just Nightmare on Elm Street specifically. My dad will let me watch. But, you know, I don't blame him. It is a scary movie. It is kind of awesome. So maybe yeah. one day. 
Yeah. <laughs> One day. I, I promise I will watch that movie. Yeah. So what was your favorite scene to shoot in this movie? Um, I think my favorite would be when we had a giant dance party at the end, but they didn't they didn't put it into a movie. It was originally gonna be like right after like right right before the credits. But it's on the Blu-ray. So if you get the okay. Blu-ray you'll be able to see it. We'll have to check it out. Did you read uh the book by any chance before starting to do this movie? I didn't read it before because I didn't want to get confused with the script, but I did read it after okay. and I thought it was great. Do you have a book recommendation or two of a book that you like that everyone should read? Well, for this specific series, I my personal favorite was The Vengeance of the Witchfinder, but in all books, I'm reading the series of Unfortunate Events books. Okay. I'm on book five, and it's really good. Thank you very much for your time. So, I think this is going to be a great movie for people to watch with their family over the holidays. So. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. You're known to have an eclectic taste in music and sort of um, sort of taking different genres and making them work together. Um, and I, I really think it was obvious in this movie because you have you have like classical, but then you have old school horror flick type sounds with the organ that you restored and played. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you sort of used all these genres and made them work in the 1950s family friendly horror movie? Yeah, so I think like the uh, obviously you mentioned it already, but like the the sort of key player in this from the beginning was this this world of turkey organ that was built in 1928, and it has this rich history that Eli mentioned in Hollywood history. It's the organ when Ray gets married in The Sound of Music and uh, Pat and Star Trek Day the Earth Stood Still, um, and so it it literally comes from the very history of Amblin that we are now a part of because of House of the Clock and its Walls. And so that kind of was this sort of fundamental sound to the score. Even when you don't notice it, it's still there sort of supporting the orchestra a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a, a pure joy to work with and it lined up perfectly. You know, that Field of Dreams quote, if you build it, they will come. Like literally within a month of finishing this organ, you know, uh, I had found out from Eli about this film that has a talking organ in it. It's like, what are the chances of that? So it was... So yeah, it was really just about creating beautiful themes, which I think are, are a rich tradition and a part of Amblin films, yeah. and then giving it sort of this uh, beautiful sort of um, instrument and, and orchestra to, to bring it to life. It's kind of cool that there's a, there's a big history with this story as a book in the 70s, and there's a, big, a huge history with the organ. Mm. Is it, how, how cool is it to own that organ that was at a studio since the 1920s? It's amazing. It, it was, uh, you know, it was forgotten about. So like this, this is a part of Hollywood history that is gone, like with silent films. And so to actually have uncovered it, like I, I found out about it through like the, the theater organ world is very tiny. And I found out that uh, this guy owned the fo former Fox Studios world. So I was like, Fox had an organ. Like, what are you yeah. talking about? And sure enough, I looked at, looked at these pictures at Fox, and there there are these um, sessions of the twenties. There in the background is the organ. So nice. uh, it, it is incredibly cool, especially as a film composer to own this piece of film music history and to be sharing it with the world. And Danny Elfman just used it, and The Grinch as well. So it's already coming back into into film in a cool way. What's the biggest difference between scoring a horror fil horror film or a spy TV show, such as The Americans, for example? I think um, ultimately in both cases, um, if I could talk about similarity first, you're really just plugging into the emotional journey of the characters and supporting that in the best way you can. Uh, you're just using sort of different musical methods to do so. Obviously, in a show like The Americans, it's um, it was something that wanted to be slightly flavored with Russia, but but not overtly so. Right. Um, uh, and then and then uh, in the, in this film, of course. There's very deliberate tip of the hat to those classic Amblin films we've talked about. Um, so, so yeah. So I think um, I think it's more more the similarity of it. Like like this is definitely um, more of a orchestral cinematic journey than the Americans was. Um, so it, it it wanted orchestra, whereas an orchestra probably would have felt out of place in the in the in the Americans. You know, as an expert in storytelling through sound and music, could you tell us a bit about if you have any favorite audiobooks or narrators? Oh, this is interesting. So uh, the the book that I listened to, um, which I don't even think it's in print anymore, it was an audio book um, by, uh, it's, so it's The Wind in the Willows, and it was read by Kenneth Williams okay. back in the 60s. It's pretty obscure. Okay. I've listened to that thing literally hundreds of times as a kid. 
Uh, so it's the Kenneth Graham "When in the Well Was My by Kenneth Williams. I, I absolutely adore that that book. And then um, Fisher Price had all these like books on tape as a kid. I listened to like Tom Sawyer and uh, Hans Brinker and all these like uh, that I just found online. I was searching for them and I yeah. found them in random places. So yeah, it's cool. Outside of audiobooks, any any do you have a book recommendation of something that you love that everyone should read? What am I reading right now? Uh, right now I'm reading a, a W. Somerset Mom book uh, he, uh, he, of human bondage. So, so uh, I don't know if I'd okay. recommend everyone read that, but it's 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 pretty yeah. cool. Um, but I mean, um, like Devil in the White City is a great book that a lot of people have read. That's soon going to be a Scorsese okay. picture. Yeah, cool. that's that's a that's a really cool dark book. And did you read the book, um, The House uh, with a Clock on Its Walls? I did. When I when I talked after talking to Eli, I went out and bought it, yeah. and uh, and I read it, and I I got a really I had already read the script, so it was really yeah. cool to see the dif- differences between the script and the book. Predates Harry Potter and, and all that, so it's like this 1970s, you know, John Belair's. He was he was doing this sort of creating and conjuring this world that was to then be reinvented again by jk rowling it's pretty cool yeah definitely yeah well thank you very much nathan for your time and uh keep on doing the great work you're doing thank you thanks so much thank you have a good day bye so i hope you enjoyed renee's interview with eli roth you're gonna have to say the other two owen vaccaro and nathan barr and the write-up about the episode will be on the Kobo Writing Life blog. We'll also direct to the original, <laughs> original. <laughs> original article yeah. on the Kobo website. And if you like the episode, please uh, comment, rate, and review. And if you have any idea about someone who you'd like to see on the podcast next, please let us know. Email us at writinglife at Kobo.com. So until next time, thank you so much for listening. For listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we provide insights and stories from leaders and experimenters in the world of self publishing. If you want even more information about growing your Kobo sales, check out our blog or find us on social. And if you're just finding us and ready to start your self publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com/writinglife. Until next time, happy writing!